The opening statements have just ended in the historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. Trump's attorney Todd Blanche started his statement by bluntly telling the jury the former president is innocent, later adding, quote, there's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. The prosecution says the case is about a criminal conspiracy and, quote, election fraud, pure and simple. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Let's bring in ABC News editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News political director Rick Klein, and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for for more on this. Uh, John, what's the latest from the courtroom? Well, waiting, quite actually, because we went on a quick little break after opening statements were completed by both prosecutors and defense, Diane. The day is getting cut short because of a personal matter involving one of the alternate jurors. So we've only got 30 minutes left of today's proceedings. So in theory, they could get started with their first witness being David Pecker by prosecutors. We're waiting to see um, if that actually does happen. So far, I think the biggest takeaways um, from opening statements made by both the prosecutors and Donald Trump's defense team, um, you know, boils down to two different arguments, right? From the prosecutor's standpoint, this is election interference. The behavior of Donald Trump, you know, is something that was well known, both NDAs and the way he he spoke about women. They referenced the infamous Access Hollywood tape that came out just weeks before the 2016 election. And on the flip side of things, um, it, it's it's the the Trump legal team that's making this argument of look, this is normal business procedure. NDAs, everybody uses them. Second. Donald Trump and Michael Cohen had a long-standing relationship as his attorney. He was advised by his attorney. He was paid back for that and other services he did for Donald Trump as an attorney. So I think the other thing that we're going to hear a lot of throughout all of these proceedings from both sides is two words, Michael Cohen. Uh, and let's go to that, Brian, because the defense didn't waste any time here talking about Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney who made this alleged hush money payment, saying toward the end of opening statements, Michael Cohen is obsessed with Donald Trump. He cannot be trusted. The prosecution also, in their opening statements, there's former President Trump live uh, walking back into that courtroom. Uh, Brian, the prosecution also prepped the jury here, saying you're going to hear a lot about Michael Cohen. What do you make about that and the level of focus on Michael Cohen just in these opening statements? So this is what I think. I think both sides are zeroing in on an element, a very important element of this crime, when with the intent to defraud. And that's going to be a big aspect here because of all the witnesses, Michael Cohen is the one that I believe can focus in on the intent aspect. He can talk about what Donald Trump allegedly sent to him as to why he was implementing this catch and kill program. And if Michael Cohen mm -hmm. cannot be believed, then the whole case falls apart. Uh, John, I, I want to bring in and let's go over to our editorial producer, John Santucci, yeah. just to sort of catch up what's happening because it's interesting to have these two cases playing out just a block away from each other. There are literally two things happening at the same time, Diane, which is just remarkable right now in court. So first, let's start what's happening in that criminal courtroom. With less than a half hour to go in today's proceedings, prosecutors have just called their first witness, David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, to the stand, the one who they say was working with Donald Trump and Michael Cohen to build out the catch and kill scheme. Mm -hmm. So that's really going to start to build their case with very little time. So obviously, he's going to come back to the stand tomorrow. But nevertheless, it just shows the speed to which Judge Mershon is moving these proceedings with the fact that openings are done. We're already on the first witness for prosecutors. So that's the criminal case. On the New York Attorney General's case, which was also, as you noted, happening today, there was an argument by prosecutor, uh, I'm sorry, attorneys for the New York Attorney General that there were some concern and issues with the bond company that eventually stepped up and met Donald Trump at the $175 million bond he had to put up in that case. Now, it seems as though for now Donald Trump's legal team was successful in stopping the bleeding in that case. They met several conditions. The New York Attorney General's team wanted to basically have stipulations as this goes forward. So that's sort of a thing that for the moment we have to sort of see if those conditions are met. The judge gave them several days to do so. My honest interpretation of that, I feel like that's going to basically go their way for now. Now we have to remember that that's bond for now. Donald Trump is still on the hook for the entire nearly half a billion dollar ruling that came down from that judge earlier this year. Of course, that ruling is being appealed by Donald Trump, so not yet clear when he'd actually have to pay up if the order is stayed, so we'll have to wait and see there.
All right. And Brian, I want to take us back now to the criminal hush money trial that we've been following all morning. Opening statements are now done. The prosecution just called David Pecker to the witness stand. He's the publisher of the National Choir, a longtime friend of former President Trump, and accused in this catch and kill scheme essentially of agreeing to be eyes and ears for Donald Trump once he decided to run for office, to seek out negative stories against the president, against the former president, then candidate Trump, and essentially make them go away, often by paying people off. How much does this testimony weigh into the larger case at hand here? It's, the, it's what we call legally the foundation. And from there, you build... That I am the one who, with Donald Trump, if you're believing in testimony, built the foundation of this catch and kill scheme. And then from there, you're just building up from the proverbial home of, okay, there's the foundation. Okay, what do we do? We caught this story, and then they're going to go into the details of this one story, and then how they are able to then kill that story based on payments. And then ultimately, they'll come to the Stormy Daniels story, and they'll do the same thing, and they'll just keep showing how this catch and kill scheme uh, worked throughout this process. Then they'll get to the actual crime that the, the prosecutors are trying. Trying to prove in this case, mm -hmm. that being the cover-up, that here is the, the scheme, here is the cover-up, this is, and hopefully we'll see an underlying crime as to why it's a, it's a felony, and an explanation as to how these charges fit, and then that will be the prosecutor trying to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. You, you sort of touched on my next question, but why is it so important for them to show that David Pecker is alleged to have been involved in, in a, a payment to Karen McDougal, a payment to a doorman who had some disparaging information against former President Trump that ended up uh, apparently not panning out. Mm -hmm. Why do they need to show that since those instances are not at the heart of this case, which is the payment to Stormy Daniels? It's not necessarily that they need to, but it definitely strengthens their case that much more. Uh, they could go straight to it and be a very boring case of here are Stormy Daniels, here is Michael Cohen, here are the elements of the crime, and then done. But their ability to to have prosecutorial discretion and to prosecute a case in the manner in which they uh, want in the way that the law allows them to, it's build this whole scheme, show how this whole entity, this enterprise operated, and so that it creates a less of an ability for the defense to pull coals in. Because if they just came forward with just Stormy Daniels' story, mm -hmm. a defense attorney like myself would come and be like, well, no, this is just a run-of-the-mill payoff. There was no scheme. There was no multiple instances of this happening. And then this is just a legal expense. And so I think for the prosecutor, they're trying to build an ironclad case with the multiple uh, catch-and-kill schemes that they're saying Donald Trump participated in. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick, the judge also ruled today that if Trump does decide to take the stand here, that he can be asked about previous cases. So that leaves him a bit more vulnerable than maybe previously thought if he does choose to take the stand. It's something attorneys may advise him against because of that. But politically, what does he have to consider in this decision of whether or not to testify in his own defense? Well, first, I never thought he was going to take the stand in this case. He has said, um, he said to reporters about a week and a half ago that he'd be glad to do it. I remember him saying the same about the Mueller probe. And, like, look, I, I think he, he, he answers yes to that. Maybe he personally would like to, but as Brian and others have been pointing out all morning, it would be a bad uh, legal move to, to take the stand. I'd also argue that it's a bad political move because you have a big potential. To, uh, you're not on camera. You have a big potential of getting yourself in further legal jeopardy, of contradicting something that's said outside. Just, and his facial expressions would be, would be analyzed without him having having the benefit of, uh, of having them broadcast all over the place, he can go outside and talk as much as he wants. And he will continue to do that and has continued to do that. So I think this makes it a little less likely that, uh, that something that was not likely to happen uh, would, ever, would ever come to pass. I don't think he's going to take the stand. And John, what are you hearing about uh, Trump's demeanor inside the courtroom so far? And how do you think Trump's team is going to feel about day one so far? Well, well so, so far from the demeanor, um, a lot of passing notes is what our team is, is reporting right now. Um, leaning in, you know, tapping his lawyers. Obviously, we talked earlier about shaking his head. What I do think is interesting and talks a little bit about what we were discussing earlier when you were asking me about family or others joining, mm -hmm. um, it seems as though the legal team that was arguing the New York Attorney General's case, which was just a few blocks away from where they are right now, has joined Donald Trump in courtroom. We saw Alina Haba, obviously another member of his legal team that was working on that case. I'm told that Alan Garten, who's chief counsel to the Trump Organization, is now in there with them. And that plays into that conversation the three of us were having a little earlier. Those are people that are a little more familiar. To Donald Trump. Alan Garten has worked for Donald Trump for nearly two decades. Uh, Alina Haba has been with him for the last several years. There are a little more familiar faces that I think in those moments of trying to keep him calm, because especially right now, this is really important in the sense that David Pecker was a longtime friend 
of Donald Trump's. Wasn't a business associate, wasn't somebody you randomly saw when you went to go play golf out in Bedminster. This is someone that they've had a long time friendship. To think that someone that is your friend, that helped you out, is getting up there on a stand to divulge all about your personal life, these are all going to be very difficult witnesses for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. let's be clear. But this is one, it's not like Michael Cohen, right, where somebody has been so outward, publicly facing, attacking you. Pecker has not said a thing about Donald Trump in the last eight plus years. Today, he's going to say a lot. Uh, Brian, what do you think are the next steps here? So the next steps, based on the schedule, I think they're done at like 12.30 today. So Pecker's going to be on the stand. I don't think his direct examination is going to end. And so he'll ultimately have to come back uh, tomorrow. The direct examination ends sometimes tomorrow morning, afternoon, then cross-examination. And then it's up to the prosecution to pick their next witness. And from my understanding, they'll probably go in that similar direction of they go from the foundation and they build up. So whoever Pecker then tapped in terms of getting that next story and how they caught that story, a witness will be able to testify to that. And then the next witness or the same witness will be able to talk about how how that story was killed and ultimately paid and then logged and then we'll go from one story to the next and ultimately go to Sterling Daniels and Michael Cohen to try to tie this all together. The big thing for me though is how these cross examinations going to go because we can kind of gauge where the direct examinations are going to yeah. go. How is the defense going to poke the holes here and we've already got a bit of a roadmap from the opening statements. Well I was going to ask you that. What do you think the opening statements revealed in terms of where that is going? Uh, well we understand what democracy is in the eyes of Donald Trump and that is influencing or at least his attorneys probably more accurate to say and that is the ability to influence an election but also right. it comes down to credibility which I think is a major aspect of this case. Will you believe Stormy Daniels uh, who got paid for her silence, who has a potential book deal and other financial incentives, and I'm sure the defense will weave that into a narrative as to why not to believe them. Yep. And then Michael Cohen as well. There is a very clear uh, guideline here, and defense, we, there's a, a jury charge. It's, it's Latin. It's, it basically translates to false in one thing, false in all things. And if you can get Michael Cohen up there and prove that he was false in one thing and get a jury to decide that he could throw out his entire testimony, it's a big win for Donald Trump, and I don't think the win here is an acquittal. I think the win here is a hung jury, and that would be massive for Donald Trump if he could do that. I don't think it's that far off. John, I see you shaking your head. Well, I think this the one point. Or nodding, that, I should and, say. No, uh, nodding. I, uh, Donald Trump shook his head. I nodded. <laughs> but, you know, I think the, the, the point that Brian made, which is important, and it's something that prosecutors just said in court, is that you mentioned Stormy Daniels and her book. Michael Cohen wrote a book. Michael Cohen is a podcast. And one of the things that the defense team is going to say is that, and, and they say this in court already in their opening, is that Michael Cohen is obsessed with Donald Trump. His livelihood is built on tearing Donald Trump down. And they do have enough, you know, things that Michael Cohen has said and done, published a book, podcast, et cetera, that would support that, right? He's also been a part of multiple legal cases involving the former president. I mean, he was, you know, today they were going through motions on it, but he was called to testify as part of the New York Attorney General's case. Here he is again. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side of that, if you're a prosecutor, it's because he was his lawyer. He was involved in everything. I mean, Donald Trump would call Michael Cohen the fixer, right? Something needed fixing that was a little not within a courtroom bounds. Call Michael. He'll deal with it. I mean, the amount of times I heard Donald Trump say, oh, just call Michael. He'll fix it. That's the relationship they had. The problem is that where we got to today is that part of that relationship crossed the line. Rick, how much do voters care about any of this? It's unclear. I mean, look, uh, we, we haven't seen it play out in as public a fashion as it has so far. We've seen polling suggest that people don't seem to think that the circumstances around the Stormy Daniels hush money case, that the, 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 the central tenets of this criminal case are necessarily criminal. But we have seen people say that if Donald Trump's convicted, they're less likely to vote for him. So both things can be true, and we'll have to see how it plays out. I don't think we can underestimate what it means to have wall-to-wall -wall coverage that examines Donald Trump's personal life in in uh, in. in in, in minute and often very awkward detail. I don't think we can underestimate what it means for Donald Trump's own activities, his own actions outside the courtroom uh, as a result of this. It's given him a new platform, for instance, to, to repeat false claims about the last election. Uh, and I also don't think that we can underestimate what it means simply to have him in a courtroom for this much time, not being in control of his surroundings. This is not what we're used to with Donald Trump. This is a different kind of news cycle that he's dominating. It is not happening on his own terms. Brian, David Pecker's on the stand now. What do you think prosecutors need to hear from him or are trying to get out of him? 
those initial conversations. What we need to do is get a glimpse of the prosecutor. Uh, the prosecutor needs to get a glimpse into Donald Trump's mindset at that time when that agreement was 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 built. What's the purpose of this catch and kill scheme? If I'm a defense attorney, I would say, hey, I'm running for public office. I'm Donald Trump. I'm a multimillionaire. I'm trying to protect my family from negative news. Are they are the defense going to be able to kind of shift that narrative towards that on cross examination, or the prosecutor is going to be able to hold firm and say, like, no, this was completely about bad press and winning the election. This was about killing stories. This was about trying to defraud the public. The theme that underlines um, why this is being done is going to be massive for either side to win. All right. John Santucci, Rick Klein, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And we Thanks. will be following this trial all day long. We'll bring you updates right here on ABC News Live.